Right. With this thing. Psalm 51. Brother Danny, so glad that you're with us. Amen. 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 Sister Martin, we're praying for you. We're praying God's touch. God's healing. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Psalm 51 starts out this way. It gives its own introduction. It says to the chief musician, a psalm of David. That's who wrote it. When Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. David lifts his voice, takes his pen in hand, cries out these ancient words, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge, I acknowledge, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speak. And be clear when thou judged. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And behold, thou desirest truth yes. in the inward part. Yes. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part. And in the hidden part, Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Yes. Our internal truth is going to impact our eternal destination. Amen. Our internal truth is going to impact our eternal destination. Could you pray with me one more time this morning? Jesus, I thank you for truth today. I thank you for the power of the precious blood of Calvary. Thank you for your presence and your anointing that's here today, Jesus. All that you are, God, all that you've done, we just thank you so very much, Lord. I pray that you work and minister, move in our hearts in these next few moments. Transform us, change us, make us new, O oh Lord, in you today. Help us, God, in this place. We love you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You can be seated this morning. She should have lived forever, at least until the Lord came. That's, that's my opinion anyway. Some things are hard to understand when you can only see from the outside, but from where I stood, there was little to indicate the internal reality that was soon to be revealed. I was younger then. I didn't understand as much about trees then as I do now. I'm certainly no arbor expert these days, but I know a little bit more than I used to. It was an old maple tree that I puzzled over. Didn't really understand. A tree whose life, it was an old tree, it was a big tree. The life of this old maple tree spanned across several generations of men. Her sprouting date, no doubt, predated the American Civil War. It was an old tree. And she fell just a few weeks before the Twin Towers fell in 2021, 2001, not 21, 21 years ago. It was an old tree. If ever a tree had a good chance to make it, this old maple tree did. She took root at the mouth of a spring that, to my knowledge, that spring has never dried up in all the years of my life and my grandfather's life. And it's just, there's always water there. And that's where this tree grew. Had its roots down deep. Spring slowed down sometimes. There are not to be dry spells, and it didn't run as fast as I'm sure it is today. But there was always a spring there. There was always water, and that's where the tree stood. The tree stood in a place that afforded at least partial protection from the strongest and worst of the winds. It's kind of down over from the top of the hill, so it didn't catch it all. It caught a lot, but not everything. 
She stood among the others that were near her equal in age, no doubt, but she, this old maple tree, outranked them all by the impressive impression left by her outward appearance. I'm telling you, it was a big old tree. Had limbs going every direction, and they were big. She was straight and tall with a base to match the challenge of her height. She had limbs large enough to match the size of small trees growing around her in her shadow. Is a big tree. She grew season after season, weathering countless storms. She lost a few branches here and there along the way, but hey, that's life. Neither Agnes in the way back before I was born, or Andrew when I was a kid, or any of the other storms that came along in between. None of those great named storms had toppled her. She stood through it all. She had roots reaching deep into a springing well of practically inexhaustible supply. She progressed each season seemingly without notice of any kind of difficulty. This tree was big and it just kept on growing. It didn't start big, it started small, but it grew big and it was impressive. But as years passed, we noticed that there were some limbs that were lacking leaves that were the sure sign of life. Where there's life on a tree, there's going to be leaves. Everything you need to know about a tree is wrapped up in that. The old tree was still alive, but it got to a point that the lack of life in her limbs was a cause for concern. It just got to a point, we looked up in it and said, hey, there's, there's a lot of dead up in that thing. And it got to be a bothersome thing because it stood close enough to the house and the barn and it's a big enough tree. If that thing goes over, it's going to be a disaster. And so it was decided, and one evening men gathered, aided by some equipment and a big old steel chainsaw, which Brother Rosenberry shouts hallelujah. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. They began the work of felling the mighty maple. I have to stop and repent already. <laughs> it was a big job. It was a big job. It was a big tree. At the base, I don't remember how big it was, but like there ain't no two or three guys reaching around it. And you could Amen. you could lay down across it. It was a big tree. Experienced hands went to work and everything went as planned. They put cables up in or there, climbed up on a ladder and put cables up and got a couple tractors to hook to it and pull it so it would the right way. And then they, they started cutting. And you know what? It fell, and it fell where it was supposed to, and everything went right. But something happened that nobody expected. Nobody expected. The standing stump of this monarch maple told an unforgettable story, and that's why I'm still preaching about it 21 years later. You'd expect in an old tree like that to be able to climb up on there and spend some time counting the rings. The impact left from each season, each year's growth, you would expect to be able to count it each season, leaving its signature inside. But in the center of this tree, after we cut it down and we started looking, we looked into the center of it and we understood then why there was deadness above. Because in the center of this tree, there was absolutely nothing. In the center of this tree where it should have been solid and sure and secure and strong, there was nothing but a hollow rottenness existing there. As a matter of fact, when it came down to it, there were only a few inches of living tree around the out edge holding the whole thing up. There wasn't near enough there to support all of the outward structure. There wasn't there was not nearly enough strength on the inside to support all that was living on the outside. All right now. Come on. There was no way to know from an outward inspection, but this old tree had died on the inside a long time ago. Yes. There was no real way to tell from the outside. You couldn't walk up there and thump on the thing and hear the hollowness in it. You just you just didn't know. But a long time ago, before it ever fell, it died inside. She held her position though. Nobody could know there was anything wrong. She stood solid and sure. She held her place. She wasn't swayed. Nothing appeared out of place on her, but her internal emptiness brought about an undeniable lack of life. Yes. Her internal emptiness brought about an undeniable lack of life in her limbs that tried to continue to reach out. 
Outwardly, she had stood the test of time. Outwardly, she had held her position in the face of many storms. She had put her roots deep and stretched herself upward and outward to an impressive extent this old big maple tree did. But at the end of it all, an inward inspection revealed the heart of the matter. And at the heart of the matter, it was seen and understood that what was thought to be so strong at the end of it all was very hollow and empty inside. Such a moment of truth had come in the life of King David when he in repentant prayer cried out behold God you desire truth in the inward parts I've come to remind somebody today that it matters more what the truth is on the inside and not what the truth that you declare is it is important what you have to say but the truth that matters most and the truth that's going to keep you standing is the truth that's on the inside Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 51 is David's heart cry to God when he had failed miserably as a man. Scripture tells us in the introduction that he had committed adultery with another man's wife. And then he had made plans and had them carried out to murder that man. It's important to understand that this did not happen when David was a young person. So much of what we understand and read and know about David hinges a lot on him being a shepherd boy and a young man who was braver than all the armies of Israel. But at this point in his life, he wasn't a kid anymore. He had grown into the role of a king. He knew how to command men. He knew how to tell fellas to get up and go. Matter of fact, he knew how to tell some pretty rough fellas to get up and go. He knew how to pick up a sword when he had to. He knew how to do some hard things. He was no kid anymore. When he fought Goliath, yeah, he was young then. When he killed 400 Philistines to earn the right to marry the king's daughter, he was, he was a young guy then. They give him some credit. When he was running from Saul in the wilderness, fleeing as a fugitive, yet he still refused to take the life of his pursuer, he was still a kid then. When Saul was killed in battle and the people sought David to make him their king, he was still a young man. But by the time this colossal sin transpired in his life, he was past that point. He was experienced. Sure. He was a seasoned veteran of many battles. He was an experienced leader that had shown there was little that lacked from his personal integrity. He had, he had built a walk and a relationship with God and a relationship with his kingdom. People understood this is David. He's a solid man. He's a good man. He'll do what's right. All outward signs indicated that his roots were deep. To look at him and look at the testimony of his life, you would expect that he was living out what is written in Psalm 1. That he was, in fact, that tree planted by rivers of water and his leaf was just growing and growing and Amen. he was alive in his season. Right. So it should be a sobering sentiment to realize that even the best of the best that even the best of the best can have an internal reality that is far different than the outward presentation. Amen. His internal reality was far different than his outward presentation. He wasn't a young man that got caught up in, in the heat of a moment or something that, that just uh, suddenly came upon him. He was, he was somebody who knew how to deal with temptation. He was somebody who knew how to deal with this kind of struggle in his life. He had been there before and he was victorious, but this time... Yes. This time he fell. What's perhaps most staggering of all is not that an experienced, seasoned person of God can stumble and fall. We can understand that. Yes. But what's most staggering to me is that David, it had seemed so much, he was able to convince himself that there was no problem in himself at all. He could look around and point out the problems that everybody else had. He could look around and point out the problems in his neighborhood and of other people. He could, he could look around at people that he knew and, and he, could, he could pass his own level of judgment on them. But internally, he failed to see who he really was and where he was with God. Right. How can you say that, Brother Frank? I'll tell you how. We don't know exactly how much time passed between what he did with Bathsheba and the time that Nathan the prophet came to talk to him. Right. But we know it was sufficient time for Bathsheba to carry a child to 
full term pregnancy yes. give birth. It is at least nine months since he had the man Uriah killed. Yeah. The child is born when Nathan the prophet comes to talk to him. He had spent a lot of time knowing what he had done. Right, he did. He spent a lot of time knowing who he was. He spent a lot of time knowing exactly what had happened and doing absolutely nothing about it other than to convince himself that it really wasn't that big a deal. It was nine months later at least when God commissioned a preacher to show up on a Sunday morning at David's house. His name was Nathan and he came and he just started telling him a story. Sometimes stories are a good way to help people. He was a trusted man that David knew was a man of God. Yes. He wasn't a visiting evangelist from right. far out. Yeah. Yes. David had never seen or heard of. There was a pastoral relationship. And he comes to David. And this is, this is what puzzles me about the story of old. And it's what puzzles me about the story still today. Because he knew what he did. He knew who he was. He knew who the man of God was. And when the man of God showed up, he wasn't even, there wasn't even a quiver in him. It's like, I don't know if we think in 2022 that God still doesn't know everything. But He still knows everything. He knew it all then. David, David did his best to convince himself that everything was okay. And folks still do that today. But we are fighting a losing battle with God. When we try to, when we try to convince ourselves that our position... Jesus, come on, Jesus. You can argue it with me, but you can't argue it with God. That's, That's right. right. That's right. So Brother Nathan comes and he just starts to tell a story. He says, David, I've come... And we'll open the sermon today with this little story from long ago. There was a man, and he was a poor man, and that poor man just had one little baby lamb. And he raised it from a little baby lamb, and he loved this little lamb, and he held it, and he took it in the house, and carried it around, and fed it milk and donuts and whatever else the little baby lambs like to eat, and uh, just gave him all the clover blossoms, didn't make him eat the greens or anything like that. He just loved this lamb, and right? He's a poor man, and that's all he had. And then his neighbor was a rich man. He had a lot more lambs than that. Yep. He had a lot of everything. Yep. And the rich man was having his friend over for supper, and he said, I'd like to have some <laughs> lamb chops for supper. And so for supper for the lamb chops, the rich man goes over to the poor man's house, and he says, hey, I have need of your lamb. Oh, and so he takes him. It takes him home, puts him in the oven, and has him for supper. And Nathan says, now David, what do you think of that? <laughs> and he did He did what any shepherd would do, man. He got wound up. David did. He said he ought to, by this time tomorrow, his head ought to be going north and the rest of him going south. That's the way this ought to go. <laughs> David got so angry he was ready to pass sentence on this man immediately. Even all this time he had no clue that the preacher was standing there trying to preach to him. Right. He had no idea that on a Sunday morning right. God was showing up to shake somebody's heart and say, hey, it's time to look around and look inside and see what's really there. It's time to get one-on-one -on -one with God and get real about yeah. what's real. Amen. 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 Yeah. He didn't even get it. I don't know how long he preached. Preached for a half hour, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I don't know. I have to go check it on YouTube. <laughs> David sat through the whole thing, folded his arms, nodded his head, said, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, that's right. At the end of the day. At the end of the day. At the end of all the preaching, he still fought. You see how messed up life gets when we convince yes. ourselves that yes. we're right. Man, there ain't, there's, there's gray areas in some things, I suppose, but there ain't no gray area even for kings when it comes to murder and adultery. Like when you kill somebody else, that it doesn't matter who you are. Everybody, little kid, adult, 150 years old knows that's wrong. It doesn't matter where you're from. 
Doesn't matter. That's universal because they, we we want that to say just in case you know somebody wants to do that to us. We that's want it to right. be known that that's that's the wrong thing to do. Uh -huh. It doesn't appear that there was any occasion that crossed his mind that the prophet today was talking to me. His sins and his guilt were so obvious to David. And friend, you think you can cover things up, but you can't cover things up like that. That's right. Yeah. There was people that knew. There was people that went and got Bathsheba, brought him over to the house. There was people that carried the letter. There was people that knew what was going on. There was, people knew who he was. Right. Sometimes we're so ignorant to think that we've got everybody fooled and the only one that's fooled yeah. is the one standing behind our glasses. Yeah. I wonder if it had been any different. And probably not. But I wonder if David felt any different the morning after him and her were together. I wonder if he felt any differently a few weeks later when he got the message that she was pregnant. I wonder if there was a moment when he got the message back from General Joab that Uriah has finally died, if things were different in his mind. What if he would have reached out to the Lord then? What if he would have reached out to the Lord? And that next day when he woke up and he knew he was all wrong. And he was tore up inside because he didn't get it right. And when, when things started to progress and he knew, he knew that things were going to spiral out of control. What if he would have went to God in that moment? What if we would have went to God in that moment before it gets all the way to the bottom, before everything is completely gone, before we're, we're just totally, totally on the far side of things and, and God has to send the preacher up in our face and say, hey, I'm trying to talk to you today. What if he would have turned to God before God came hunting for him? Right. The great danger demonstrated by David is that we're able to convince ourselves to believe our own lie. He was fully convinced. He was fully convinced. He was fully convinced. He was, fully convinced. He was able to go on living. It seems very much like he slept every night just fine. He didn't lose weight or have other ill effects on his health. He just... Man, he had pushed through it. He was good. Yep. He went to church the next week. The sermon wasn't about murder or adultery. He said, hey, <laughs> guess if I was in trouble, I'd have heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> so they figured it's probably all right. Yeah. Hey, listen, God's delay of judgment is not equal to his approval. Yeah. Yeah. God, so thank God that He is generous. Yeah, thank God that right. He gives us some space yeah, for grace. And He yeah. gives us some time to work it out. And He loves us enough to offer repentance with the, the assurance that except you repent, you'll surely perish. Right, right. Except you repent. Jesus walked to Jerusalem one day with His disciples. He come across another tree. Tree stories seem to go well. This was a fig tree, not a maple tree that he came to. He's walking, and he was hungry, as most guys get. And so he went over to this tree and said, I believe I'll have a fig. The tree looked like it ought to have figs on because it had leaves on. So he reached up in there expecting to find some fruit. It's the natural process of a fig tree, according to my grandmother, my wife's grandmother, who grew up in Greece, who grew up with fig trees all around her. The natural process for a fig tree is that somehow it produces the fruit first, and then the leaves come out and cover the fruit. So that if there are leaves on a tree, on a fig tree, it is the accepted understanding that if there's leaves there, there should be fruit there. If there's leaves there, that's a declaration that there's going to be fruit there. If there's something like that showing on the outside, then, then the expectation is there should be something on the inside. So Jesus went over there and he wasn't interested in having a leaf sandwich. He wanted to have a fig. <laughs> And so he reaches up in there and he reaches into these leaves and there was no fig. And he thought, well, uh, 
you know, probably somebody hungrier than me was here. And so he walked around to the other side of the tree, and there were no figs over there. And he thought, well, maybe there was a squirrel. And so, I don't know, maybe he got a stepladder and climbed up to the top of the tree. I'm not exactly sure, but he came to the conclusion that in that tree, there was not a single fig. Amen. And he said, this just isn't going to work. This isn't the kind of thing that pleases me. If it's saying on the outside that it possesses something on the inside, then when I reach up there, there ought to be something there. Friend of mine, if we're going to please the Lord, if we're going to declare something on the outside, then we better have something growing on the inside that matches our outward presentation. And it's time to get over walking around saying what we think about everything and start getting it up in our heart and down in our soul and being real in our relationship with God. We live in a culture of superficial on the surface living. When in the center of it all, there's really not too much there holding it all up. Friend of mine, that ain't the kind of church that the Lord wants to have. That ain't the kind of church that the last day church is supposed to be. On the day of Pentecost, it was just a, a backwoods upper room, if you will. It wasn't no special place. Right. On the outside. Right. But on the inside, my friend, there was something in there like the world had never seen. It was greater than anything that had ever been experienced. It matters more. Your internal truth. Amen. Your internal truth matters more than any external circumstance. Jesus started to preach about it one day. He said, Some people are like that fig tree. He said, With their mouths they draw near to me, but their heart is far from me. They know what to say. But it stops somewhere. It doesn't really get. It doesn't really get the whole way. They know how to say the right thing. But he said they, their heart, it's so far away. And he said, you know why that matters? In Matthew fifteen and nine, Jesus said, "For out of the heart, you ever wonder what comes out of a heart? Yeah. Evil thoughts, yes. murders, mm -hmm. adulteries." I don't know. He must have known David. I, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. People don't go around bragging about that stuff. No. But it comes from their heart. Our internal condition is of the highest priority of God. Our internal condition is the highest priority of God. And it should be to us. That's right. Paul preached it all through the New Testament. We're the, we're the temple of the living God. Will you look at the temple, the tabernacle of the Old Testament? On the outside, it was orderly, but it was ordinary. Mm -hmm. People say it was ugly. I don't know if it was ugly, but it wasn't fancy. Mm -hmm. But they put it together straight and square. They lined things up. It was symmetrical. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. It's the same on one side, like they ran a center line. And oh, that just makes me happy. <laughs> On the outside, it was ordinary, but on the inside, yes, it was ordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the outside, it was just everyday looking stuff. Yeah. But on the inside, it was covered with gold. Yeah. On the inside, yes. on the inside, there was, there was anointing. And on the inside, there was incense burning. There was worship. Mm -hmm. Our internal, our internal condition. Our internal condition should be of our highest priority. Jesus said, let me help you. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And you'll have something on the inside that flows an unstoppable, refreshing stream to the outside. He said, you bring me your external problem and I can give you an internal solution that will take care of that. You bring me your trouble that's bothering your outside. Just give me a chance to do something on your inside. 
If you're coming today with trouble from this world and trouble in your life and external problems of finance or health or all of those things, we do well to open up and get past all of that and let God do something in our heart. Yes. If you've got problems with people, if you've got problems in your family, we would we pray sometimes, God change them, God fix them, God move them, God do something with them, but we get a whole lot further. Come on. Yes. Amen. Yes. If we show up and come along and say, God, yes. just let's make sure before you do anything with anybody else, let's just make sure we got it right in here. Yes. It's no wonder Paul would pray for the Ephesian church that way. In Ephesians 3.16, he said, I pray for you that God would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. He said, you need to be alive on the inside. You need to be alive on the inside. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The old apostle pastor said, hey, I want to pray for you today. Not for everything that's going on the outside around you, but I want to pray for your soul. I pray that God would strengthen you in the inner man. I pray that that God would do something down in your heart and down in your life that you would open a door for God that you've not opened before. Let Him bring you here. Let's stand together this morning. God in His love for us will reach out with the message of reality like He did for me. He'll knock on our door. He'll talk to you. He'll talk to you in a way that you can't ignore or deny. We may not choose to respond, but there can be no doubt yes. that it was God, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Nathan was there. He looked at that man, David, who was so ready to judge another man. He said, David, today I'm preaching to you. It's you. Mm-hmm. Thou art the man. And from that moment forward, from that moment forward, everything that David had built in his mind came crumbling down in the reality of the presence of God. Just like he was a kid. Just there's... Built a place to hide and it all fell down. Now he stands there before God. The same man who wrote in Psalm 16, 8, the pastor preached about it just a few weeks ago. David said, I have set the Lord always before me. Amen. But in Psalm 51 and 3, you know what he said? He said, here on this day, my sin is ever before me. I yes. set the Lord always before me, but today, my sin is ever before me. If you're standing in a place today where your sin is ever before you, it's time to do what David did and turn again. And turn again to face your Savior. If you're living in a place where you're looking forward and all you can see is your failure, it's time to take a turn and set the Lord before you again. And set the Lord before you again. Thank you, Lord. I come to this psalm a lot of times. Psalm 51. Times when life is out of place. There's times that I'm sure that I'm wrong. And I come here. And I pray this. God help me. And the older I get, the more often I come. Yes when I'm pretty sure that somebody else is probably wrong. And I can hear anyone. Yes, yes, amen. Even though I know they're, they're out of line or they're wrong. Because I just want to make sure before I point a finger, before I pass a judgment, that I've come to this place and let God search through me. Sometimes when I don't think there's anything wrong at all, I come back to this psalm anyway. 
And I just say, God, have mercy on me all over again. What matters more than any external detail about who's right or who's wrong is the reality of the internal truth of who we are and who we are with God. Thank you, Jesus. So David's repentant heart reached out for God with this request. He said, God, I know I'm wrong now. And this is what he asked. He said, create. He didn't say create a way out of this. He didn't say create a way past this. He didn't say create a way around this or create people's memory to forget about all that I've done. He said create in me. Create in me. I can't do it, God, but I know you can. If anybody can, you can. I've failed, I've fallen, I've done wrong. But if anybody can fix this, God, it's you. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Boy, there's days that just... That's the only thing that matters. Sometimes you are right. Sometimes you're wrong. Whether you're right or wrong, we need the Lord to create a right spirit in us. He asked only then for this. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And what a whole bunch of us need today. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Sooner or later, I know it's a heavy message, but at the end of it all, we can rejoice. Because at the end of it all, He is out for our redemption. He's not out for our doom. He's not out for our end. He's not out to cast us away. He is hoping and waiting today that somebody would push past this preacher's closing and just get to an altar and say, God, have mercy on me today. The Lord is just hoping that somebody will want a place of repentance so bad that He won't wait for the preacher to say amen. Then He's just going to come pray in any way and say, God, make me new and make me over again. The internal truth. There's an internal truth that can become your eternal reality today. Because whatever's happened, whatever's gone right, or whatever's gone wrong. David didn't know this when he prayed, created me a clean heart, but we can pray today. And the Holy Ghost will come into our hearts. It'll do more than make us clean. It'll make us a new creature in Him. A complete new person. And your internal reality carry you to eternity with Him. Can we lift our hands this morning? God bless you, Almighty.